Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Edge and Flow podcast. This is TJ Schwartz. I'm here with Lucas Burnley. And on this podcast, we talk about knife making, manufacturing, design, art, and our uh, kind of, I don't know, interesting lives, I guess you might say, and things that we do on a daily basis. Or our, like our standard lives that yeah. are interesting to us and we're trying yeah. to navigate. Like yeah, that's everybody. why I paused. I was like, I don't know if it's really that interesting. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I would say it's like pretty human condition. Yeah, yeah, exactly. At this point, or oh, definitely maker condition, right? That's where sure. you're kind of, we're navigating the process of family and yeah, kind of business, Yeah, maybe like slight obsession. There's some, yeah. there's some things in there. Mm-hmm. Um, Before we started recording, you, you had started to dive into shop update. So we should probably just start there. Okay. Yeah, so new shop, uh, lots been happening. It's absolutely been around the clock, like seven days a week situation right now, which is tiring, very tiring, mm-hmm. but very, very, very exciting, like rich with optimism too. So mm-hmm. it's like tiring, but not like emotionally exhausting at the same time. Uh, but what we have done is framed in, sheet rocked, and down to just like a few elements of paint here and there. Um, hung doors like so a lot of that like just straight up straight up you know contractor type work but my wife and I went in there and did and then I built a new wall that separates uh, the dustier side of the shop from what will be like the machine side of the shop and then I talked to an electrician yesterday and I was like okay this is what I need rough idea and I figured they'd be like yeah a couple weeks you know we'll try to work in And they're like, well, next week we have a big job. And if you want us to help you, it's going to have to be today and tomorrow. Uh And I was like, oh. And so I had a a mental idea of what I needed done. And so I immediately rushed over there with blue tape and started putting it on the wall, like 120 volt, you know what I mean? 20 amp, like 220 volt, 20 amp, like just started. And I had the idea over the last month, but having to like put it down on paper as fast as possible. Um, and then had him come to the shop and we talked it all over. So tomorrow morning at eight 30, they're starting, um, and they're oh. running, running electrical. So it was oh, like, man, I thought I was just going to kind of get in queue and they're like, Oh, we're going to be there, dude. Seeing that's amazing. In, actually in a day. Yeah. Good on so, you for being able to like figure it out or like finalize everything that quickly. I would have really struggled with that. Um, well, the good news is I had like a graphing paper sheet where I already mm. mapped like the okay. physical locations out and I had done a little bit of digging around on that electrical. And so I had a like 80% of the way figured out. Um, so I went in and I even went in Adobe illustrator and drew up like a, like a map of outlets so that I can put the blue tape up and then I can give it to them. So I just thought if they had that to look at, it could help them plan the overall circuit design as mm-hmm. opposed to just where the outlets are. Mm -hmm. Um, and so the weird thing is the power for like the big stuff, like the mills and stuff is like the easiest part Mm -hmm. because they're just right in front of the panel and the wire is actually left there by the previous tenant to do that. Right. So you're, but it's, there's a pretty big lack of 120 volt circuits in the shop because it's always been a machine shop Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, a machine shop that just mills and lathe turn stuff and they don't have a lot of like finishing stuff. Right. They don't really use 120 volt. It's just three phase all the way through. Um, so I need to have, you know, a tumbler on 120. I need to have like, I can finally use my drill press as a drill press instead of a grinder stand. Yeah. So, you know, t- the TW90 put an outlet in for that. And so if it goes really good. Oh, and they're also redoing all the lights, <laughs> which is oh wow. awesome. Yeah. Are you changing your the type of lighting or? Yeah. yeah. What are you going to? Uh they recommend we're still in the air on that because what they said they're like here's what you should do you should put outlets where all your fixtures are as opposed to hard wiring them Mm -hmm. and then if you want to put a cheap light in to get you by you can like from amazon and then if you want to spend a lot of money the good news is you can take them with you because they're just plugged in yeah when when we someday moved out Uh, that's super smart that was what my electrician recommended when we built our shop and at first i kind of didn't like it yeah but it makes perfect. It's like, oh, you want to swap out a ballast? Like you just go and swap Unplugged. it out. Easy. Yeah. yeah. So that's what that's what they're going to do. So like for them, they don't really have to think about that, about the fixtures. Mm-hmm. So in the next week, we'll have to kind of decide on what the fixtures are going to be. But they're for sure LED, obviously. But nice. um, 
but they they re- they said the best the best option in their mind is actually not the stick lights it's the ufo lights they said so it's like a 12 inch circle and it kind of casts mm. like directionally and yeah. they said that the taller the ceiling the more you want that yeah that makes sense really taller sad. ceiling you want to go to round lights i am super super light sensitive hmm. in in the way that like if if i have lights in a shop that i don't like it drives me nuts mm. constantly mm-hmm. um and i like a lot of light although oddly enough like as i get older i obviously like a lot of light and i probably need more light but there's areas of the shop where I just, I actually would love it to be tuned down for a little bit. Definitely forging. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but just like in general, I'm like, I, I don't need that much right now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I kind of went for like baseball field. Like I want no shadows. Yeah. Anywhere. Yeah. yeah. Like, so. That's, that's sort of what they're doing in our, in there. Um, but we'll see. I mean, cause like I said, they, what they told me is they're like, we got a bunch of used lights. We have like, as an electrical contractor, they're like, we have piles of random used lights. So they're like, great. what we'll probably do is they'll, they'll wire in all the outlets. So it doesn't matter what the fixture is. We'll have them just throw in like whatever used crap that they have just to get us turnkey so that if we had to order, we're not waiting on lights and all that. And then we'll replace them with high end upgrades right. in the areas that matter most throughout. You know what I mean? It's probably the, the way it's like going to go. Great- electrician dude they're awesome uh is it somebody that you knew no well so steven srg armament uh-huh. who i'm sharing the shop with he uh he's had multiple jobs done by them okay and he swore by them so he just sent them my way so yeah they, they were on the ball um That's so awesome i love happy. it when they're able to like make recommendations and as opposed to just being like what do you want and you're like i'm not sure and they're like well yeah you should know. figure it out figure yeah. it out and it's like no man you're an expert mm-hmm. like and you yeah. have opinions like yeah i'm just asking for an opinion yeah yeah that's pretty sweet yeah and so. you've got like and they're letting you use used ballast like that's amazing that's like good yeah. good community yeah, yeah. it's it's nice. it should be good because in all honesty like we could we could get by with not very much light because yeah. for a while because we're only using a small square footage so even if we just started upgrading lights, sort of where we actually put equipment, as opposed to just illuminating a like empty space for a long mm-hmm. time, so it'll that'll the lights will be a work in progress. But what I want done is the circuits, the light switches, the electrical is all there, so it's just plug and play from there on out. Mm-hmm. Um, so we'll see how long it takes them to do that, but they're starting tomorrow. So nice, man. Yeah. So what what happens after that? So. I'm soft deadlining myself to be ready uh, on the 23rd is what I'm thinking as a goal for the rigger. The bummer is I can't really call the rigger until the power's done because if something happens and the power takes another week or two right? and the rigger's scheduled and I'm in a a bit of a jackknife situation. Um, So I'm waiting for the power to get done. So I can't hard schedule, but between now and the 23rd, I'm going to get air completely sorted with okay. chucks and all that while the walls are exposed. Um, like I said, I've got to finish the paint and there's one more door I got to hang. So not a lot, not That's a lot. Great. Yeah. Um, man, I just lost track of what I was going to ask you. Oh, uh, rigor. Have you already reached out to the rigor? Yeah. Yeah. I talked so to you him already. A while okay. Back. So you yeah. know, like what his timeline is and, and availability and forgot. We haven't talked about this on the pod, but my, Brother-in-law Ron, who does my surface grinding, just bought mm-hmm. a new ish, new to him, uh Chevalier or Chevalier mm-hmm. surface grinder. Um, and the rigger that's gonna help me out just delivered his. Oh, nice. Um, and so I was talking to him about how they build him and how they structured it and stuff. Um, so kind of got a, a pretty good idea of that. But nice. Yeah. So that second surface grinder is just is purely that like in- to increase running capacity. too much so capacity wise yeah. okay capacity yep nice yep yep um so yeah this is a way t- way stouter machine too um i think it weighs oh like, really it's like five thousand pounds right that's a chunk. and yeah 24 by 12 so it's the same size chuck but 
way bigger spindle, way bigger casting, and mm. it's a 10 horse motor. Oh, wow. So it's, yeah, it's kind of a tank. Um, so we're curious to see just if he can use it differently or if it's just going to be used in the same way, uh, or if maybe one's the rougher and one's the finisher or vice versa. I don't know. Oh, um, interesting. But he just needed more ability, you know, and then he, I think I mentioned before, he got a hundred wheels with it. A hundred. That's he had to crazy. build he had to build a crate that was like eight feet long specifically to get the wheels because it's a 14 inch wheel grinder oh. so oh wow 14 yeah. inch wheel two inches wide too yeah they're huge that's huge and it came with so on those they have like a uh, kind of a spindle that has like a like a quick change sort of thing but you have to have mul- multiple uh what are they uh Hubs. i forget hubs yeah that's the right one uh it came with like three hubs came with the wheel balancer came with wow. like all the all this you know side equipment so it's pretty awesome service grinding really is a science yeah like i mean science slash art like all yeah. of this stuff but it's not it's at least for me it's never just been like here's how you do it there's always a feel there's yeah. always something you're listening to yeah. or like watching to yeah. really it's a really uh fine skill set tactile yeah, yeah exactly yeah yeah and it's like pretty old school like i mean all the equipment that we're using is like even that is it chevalier no i always want to say chevalier too that yeah that's cool <laughs> actually don't know um i think it's chevalier mm-hmm. um like what is that 80s uh his is newer than that i want to oh, say really? i want to say it's late 90s i mean they still okay. make they still yeah. make grinders um but no is it is it like automatic down feed? Is yeah, there a way? Yeah, to... it's full CNC. Oh, it's full CNC. Yeah, yeah. I mean, thick surface grinders are weird though. When you say full yeah, CNC, I know it's auto feed. Yep, and auto traverse. Traverse, like it, it, in all by all accounts, it runs automatically. Yeah. So you basically like yeah. zero it out. You start. Yeah. The, you start the grind. You set. You the... zero it out. You tell how you tell it how much you want to remove. Yep. Exactly. And it goes to that depth. Yep. Yeah, that's amazing. And the other one he has is also that way though. Um but Got just it. the interface is very different, but yes. Yeah, okay. Older machine. Yeah. A little bit older. Yeah. I think the other one might be late eighties and this one's the nineties, something like that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I finally have a machine. I've got hydraulic power feeds, but you still have to babysit it. Yeah, and his is both of these are hydraulic as well yeah. for the travel. Yeah. But not for the feed. Does that oh, make sense? So like stepper motor for feed. Well, I know the older one he has has a stepper motor for the Z or for yeah, the, that for the down feed. Yeah. But the new one I think is actually, I think it's gear driven. So, uh, honestly, it's, I don't know. I haven't looked at it that close yet, but neat. Interesting it for is. sure. All right. So that is, those are shop updates. And then you've got the LT five going. Yeah. So the juggling situation is keeping production going on the like standard knives overland overland sport all that and then the shop and then the lt5 which i've been able to kind of work back in a little bit and get a little bit more progress on um had a bit of a hiccup i was building a fixture and some basic machining principles that i overlooked cost me the fixture because i Mm. broke two taps off in it and that would have been fine, except the reason one of the taps broke is the drill wandered on the pre-drill for the tap, and those holes could not, they could not be out of alignment. They had to right. be straight, and it was just, at that point, it's gone. So You're done. I remade at it. At least you yeah. caught it before, like, you put in the work to, like, extract the taps. Yeah. Because like, yeah. that would have been a bummer. Yeah. So I've got a fixture that looks identical to the eye, has two broken taps in it, but is now i think i can deck it off if yeah. i can get the tap out of the way i could deck it off and i could use it for like some kydex fixture or something mm-hmm. like that just um, something yeah nice but but yeah i'm so working a... i'm working through my fixturing process so i'm kind of like trailing you a little bit and asking you for help um but basically i can't remember where we were at last time but um the kihon is in for water jet mm-hmm. officially yeah, that, um, that's new. That's awesome. So that is, that's super exciting. I actually found a local place that does water jet. So I was able to drive it over and like talk to the guy. Um, we'll see how that works out. You and I were kind of talking about this, which is like big picture. 
sometimes I feel like it's almost worthwhile just going to like a known quantity mm -hmm. that, that this is in their workflow, like knives are in their workflow. Um, but I love, I mean, I love when I can find stuff local. Yeah. Local is hard so, to beat, man. Yeah. I figured I'd yeah. start there. Um, I basically for this prototype run, I had a, like a big sheet of AEBL. So I figured I'd just run that. Um, mm -hmm. and while that's happening, I am, the fixture is designed now I'm moving on to cam mm -hmm. and it's really cool because the way that you're doing this is similar to the way that I've done it. It's just, it's just thought out further. Um, and it's based on the Pearson system. Um, mm -hmm which ultimately doesn't really matter, but it like, it's fun for me because it's like yeah. giving me like a little bit of dopamine to like build fixtures. Yeah. Like, Ooh, yeah. new system. And like, yeah. um, so Dude, it's, it's a Pearson different. Putting a Pearson in a machine is one of the most satisfying feelings. Dude, I'm so excited. Yeah. It's well, very... and, and also like seeing, being able to see the 3d models, like of the, the base and of the palette. I've never fully modeled anything that I even things that I've palletized. Mm -hmm. And so this really is like a new world for me as far as like how I'm viewing fixturing and machining, because I'm so used to kind of knowing what's there and like extrapolating out and like mm -hmm. judging every like, Oh, I'm like checking clearances based on like numerical heights and stuff. Mm -hmm. This is so neat to be able to see, like I ran a test yesterday and it's like, Oh, like, I crashed my spindle into my part and it's like, Oh, because I didn't change like the tool out, but it's just like interesting, interesting process. It's like, feels familiar, but I'm struggling with like, like small details. Like now that I'm working in, in fusions cam, it's like all oh, there. It's just knowing where to find it. Yeah. Um, so yeah. yeah. Next big task for me is to build out a tool library. Um, and then I'm going to try to get cam done for that and then move on to the scales. Mm -hmm. um, and this was, I, I, so I threw a, I threw a question in our, our chat or like pod chat with basically something that I'm running into right now. It's kind of maybe tied to this a little bit, but basic, basic idea is like, do you feel the need or are you feeling the need to constantly improve your product? And it's like the thought, the idea almost starts to break down as soon as I say product, because it's like a maker mindset. And you, how did you phrase it? Like you like top, like basically just like topping all of your, you like do work and then high marking, high marking. Yeah. Right. So are you finding, on a day-to-day -day basis that you're like looking for areas to high mark yourself or no? Uh, I would say absolutely. Yes. Okay. But true to the process is the product. It's I want to high mark on the efficiency okay. and repeatability and the, actually the simplicity of an operation. Yeah. So it's like for me, high marking is how simple can we do it and yeah. how like smooth can it be? Right. Um, so the product, like if you were a consumer and you bought them to a product that's a few months later, it wouldn't like we're always making small improvements where we can, but the massive improvements that are happening are behind the scenes to make right. it happen easier and better. Right. And as time goes on, theoretically, at least I think you make less like big changes, right? It becomes like smaller and smaller refinements. Theoretically, well, yeah. Yeah, theoretically. Well, and this is this is like the area that I think my brain is so trained in a certain way, which is like every knife you make should be better than the last. Mm -hmm. I was working on a batch of polys, right? Which is like simple titanium pry bar. And I just noticed myself being like, man, I should be like doing something more complicated than this. I should be like, and I was like, why am I doing that? Like, this is a product that is in my line. There are efficiencies I can make to this like upgrades I can make to this product, but I like the product, mm -hmm. but in the back of my brain, I've got like this knife maker mode. That's like the opposite of creating simplicity, 
it's like wanting to make it more complex, mm-hmm. require more skill level, like all of these these things that are kind of like tied into the craft side of it. Mm-hmm. And as I'm building these fixtures and like looking at having a model that is like closer to like our own production, it just made me like, think about it. And I'm like, yeah, is there, is there a solution to it? Or like, how do you navigate it? Cause I don't want to like, I mean, over time, like I've had models that I make consistently, but the process was never like super, super dialed. And I would still like tweak and change and like mess with stuff. Mm-hmm. And so I feel like this, like doing this is almost like made me look at that, um, that kind of uh, like process or tendency again. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah, no, I, I can, I know exactly what you're talking about. And I got to say, like, I really do feel like I have the same sensation of like Mm -hmm. it's like more 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 from a i want to understand it i want to take it further i want to like push the envelope i guess it's just maybe i think it maybe is probably healthy to have that it's just like where is it going maybe it's the same it's the same thing as growth or or like money mm -hmm. right i think where like there is there is a point where like enough gets you where you need to be mm-hmm. and like being honest about what enough is can help you direct a lot of your decisions. And so with this, yeah, it, man, it is, it's such a strange, it is such a strange like mentality to like constantly feel like you need to be like, one upping yourself mm-hmm. when it comes to physic like a, a production product or like a standard model that's not the goal that's like mm-hmm. not the goal of a standard model right you like mm-hmm. design it it's awesome you make it people like it sure improve on it as time goes on but it's not like completely one up it make that thing obsolete because then you get into this cycle of like constant development mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. which from a business standpoint isn't effective. And you can become trapped by that too, because if you train a following or a customer base to knowing that what they have is going to be obsolete quickly, then you become like a slave to making sure that it does. You know what I mean? Making sure that the new is new. It new is that much better. You see it in like the auto industry. It's like, it's like, well, I like it. It's great but they didn't but, make it new enough. You know what I mean? It's like, right. well, can you do that forever? You know what I mean? That's the question. And is it, and is it the goal? It's like, it comes back to the why thing, right? Which is, I mean, looking at this as a company, I think, I think I'm, I'm having to look at our business more as a business as time goes on. Even if it's from the standpoint of me wanting to have areas where I can have like, untethered creativity Mm -hmm. because at this point with the demands on my time and like the obligations to family, I'm not willing to like forego one for the other. Mm -hmm. So at this point I'm looking at being more efficient as the means to allow for more creativity. Exactly. Yeah. But separating the thoughts right now is hard because I'll start doing, I'm like starting to do like, basically like the production work. So we've talked about this a little bit on the pod, which is uh, I, I basically laid out a really rudimentary, like monthly accountability guideline for like, Mm -hmm. I have to make this, these products, boom, boom, boom. I made it about three months. And then what happens like the ADHD process happens, like always the same thing. I get bored and I, And I start to like forget the reasoning and I start to rationalize changing Mm -hmm. and it's wild. Like, so now I've got like a, I've got in Trello, I've got a note that basically is just reminding me of like what the purpose of this monthly output is. Mm -hmm. And it's like binary. Mm -hmm. That happens until this 
happens. Yeah. yeah. But it my, my brain will just start spiraling off. And it's like trying to find reasons to not do that thing. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, it's wild. Yeah. It's a, it's a man harnessing the mind and like making the mind do what you want it to do is so weird. And maybe making it do something is not the right way to look at it. Maybe it's like, takes more of a tender touch than that but like the Mm -hmm. it's weird how your own mind is like uh i don't know if tender is the way that i would put it i think it's like i have to trick my mind yeah right right (laughs) basically it's like it's like a shell game Mm -hmm. kind of where you're like a bait and switch it's like a bait and switch you're like all right here's the new thing like no it's just repackaged yeah like (laughs) yeah but i don't know yeah no that's a the mind hacks I, guess you I just them. wonder, like, because I mean, at this point, there's more makers kind of starting to play with like production modalities. Mm-hmm. And I wonder if that is a common theme. Um, and I, this made me think about like custom makers in general to where that tendency is not like universal. There are many, many makers who make the the same models the same way they might get better, right? Like they, from improvement stand, mm-hmm. like, or just like the refinement. Yeah. yeah. But those models stay the same. Mm-hmm. And so I don't think like, I don't think they would have a hard time transitioning into more like rigid production. Yeah. Really like because I've I've even like started like in my head, I'm like, man, okay, well, I'm like making this model. I'm like, this is really taking a long time. And like because like a folder for me in the past, in a way, took less like R and D than this fixed blade is taking because of how I was doing my machining mm-hmm. from like a much more prototype level, like tabbed. Mm-hmm. Right. So like some of the parts were indexable. A lot of them were just tabbed with this model. I'm really trying to like take those methods to like their logical conclusion. Yeah. Like this is the efficient way to do it. Yeah. But as you do that, you get less flexibility. Well, and the phrase that you've said before that I liked is like simple is not. Yeah. It's like, it's almost like the simpler you want the process to be, the more hard and complicated it is to make that process. On the front end. Yeah. On the front end. Yeah. Yeah. Like it that, is com- from the drawings forward. Like I'm like, these are by far the most complicated drawings I have ever made. And then that goes into this is the most complicated fixture I have ever made. Yeah. And Even at the though, end of it. Yeah. The knife it, is simpler than many knives you've the made. The knife but, itself but, is yeah. simpler, but but at the end of the day, when the process actually begins, when manufacturing begins it will be by far the simplest product that I can make in a certain yeah. way because yeah. it's so, it's so thought out. Right. Right. Um, yeah. It's cool. It's just like, I just noticed these, like these little, these little poles, different directions. And I think, I think a lot of this stuff is like kind of tying back around to like uh, almost like having like mental health projects. Where you're like, I drew, I drew a knife today and I'm like, oh, I want to make that, but I just want to make one of them. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like a short sword. That's nice. like, but I want to give myself the freedom to be able to do those because I think that's what he, like, in a in a big way, like keeps me interested in not only like our field, but just kind of like making and mm-hmm. shop and skills in general, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I think where I've found the ability to like on the mental health and like the creative flow standpoint and the satisfaction side is like my obsession and my creative moments and like that flow state is happening. Like I said, with the modification of the workflow and with Mm -hmm. the modification of fixtures and stuff like that. And so it's like, I feel like I have this, I'm being more creative than I've ever been kind of feeling but it's on a different topic it's a different it's a behind the scenes kind of creativity if that makes sense no it makes it makes perfect sense and 
in a way, like where you are at now is perfect because those improvements fit well with the production that you're doing. And like a lot of times I'm kind of pushing the rope where I'm like, oh man, I want to make these improvements to the shop, but that fully stops work. And it's like not, they're not running parallel. Mm -hmm. Right. So I'm trying to figure out like, okay, I need like two or three days to make some shop improvements. And that with moving into like, like more fixtured parts, like new processes. It's like the downstream effects of that, like affect the rest of the shop. Cause all mm -hmm. of a sudden I'm realizing like, Oh man, if I'm doing this and I start to hit these numbers, like this area of the shop, like is doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Because it had existed in this like randomly creative, like even looking through parts and stuff, I'm like, I basically have the equivalent of like the home junkyard, you know what I mean? In parts drawers, because I never knew what I would be designing and I might need some like really weird random screw or collar or pin. Mm -hmm. And as I'm looking at it now, I'm like, this is not the type of maker that I am currently. Mm. And it's yeah. strange because you're like, yeah. there's 20 years of materials and I go to this drawer and you're like, Oh, it's all like, you know, uh, antler and ivory. Mm -hmm. And you're like, oh, I'm not going to get rid of it, but it feels out of place as I'm like, yeah. Trying to sort through like Kanban, like yeah, for right. handle hardware, like right, they're right. different. They're like different thought, not processes, but like different parts of your brain. Almost. Yeah. Yeah. So you're looking at everything through a different lens now. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No, I know what you mean. Yeah. Weird. Yeah, man. I'm I'm looking forward to seeing you get that up online. I'm I'm really excited to see the the Pearson Haas combination take off the ground and it'll be it'll be fun Me to watch. Too. I think like so I've got I've got the Pearson base plate. It's weird because I have a Jurgen system. Mm -hmm. And just looking at it, we were like, okay, easiest way is just get another Jurgens sub plate or you know, fixture palette and put the Pearson on that palette. So I basically have palette on palette. Yeah. Um, but it works, works really well. Mm -hmm. Um, and so theoretically I'm pretty ready to go. I need to hook it into air. Mm -hmm. Um, but I have a feeling like once I get parts back from water jet, I think it'll probably kind of light a fire under me because I'll have something tangible. Yep. Yep. That's um, absolutely true. Think, yeah. Yeah. So yes, I want to try to have the base work done. Like if I can have a tooling library and like some basic cam figured out, maybe here's a question. Would you recommend cutting the fixtures before I get parts back from water jet? Or should I wait till I have parts in hand? Uh, you're fine cutting it before I'm you fine get the water jet. It. Yeah. Yeah. And then I can modify if I need to, once I have it. Yeah. If the water jet would have to be pretty bad. Yeah. before that would be necessary just because of the the way the fixtures set up like yeah it would be surprising like yeah. we've never had to do that oh i did have i did have one glitch okay so i sent in basically i sent in a dxf mm -hmm. i sent in a schematic and some screenshots when i was there he was like we he like gave me like a tour of the plant pretty cool um i want to go back through because it was fast but they have a lot of machinery you know, the fifth mm -hmm. axis like big dusons like you know a uh, bunch of turning centers cool stuff um mostly i think they mostly do aerospace um so like they every part that i saw looked nice areas were clean I saw some water jet parts all looked super crisp Mm -hmm. like not a yeah. lot of draft like all look good um mm -hmm. but so we go sit down and he pulls it up on screen and inside one of the like weight reduction pockets there was a straight line in one of the corners where there's a radius and they're all equal radii hmm. no idea what happened we went back he saved it like as an earlier version of a dxf and it corrected 
weird so yeah i was like okay so is it too new of a like a fusion file for like an older like flow water chat file i did i was just like yeah, if if i hadn't have been standing there it wouldn't i don't know that it would have gotten caught yeah that's interesting dude that's i, I don't know if i've seen that specifically yeah it was that's really weird. he had neither he was like huh and we were like, okay, like maybe there's like a, a a hidden line there, but I did like a straight export, like this layer only, and everything else, like the in the schematic, it was printed out correctly. So it's mm -hmm. like it was the output was correct. Yeah. Just when he imported it, something broke. Yeah, like a, a translation error between two different softwares. Yeah. Yeah, I I do I will say that uh I did I helped a laser shop doing a bunch of CAD years back and they brought in DXFs all the time and they're a laser shop. That's all they really did. Mm -hmm. And, uh, they, I never was the one messing around with that, but I do remember them talking about lots of weird DXFs that had to be fixed. Um, so I don't know if it's a similar thing or if it natively, if the DXF was actually jacked up. Do in the you first know, place. do you know, like exporting a DXF from fusion 360, are you able to save it as different versions I've never, of a seen DXF. That. Okay. I've never seen like that. Okay. Like Rhino, Rhino's crazy because like you can go in and you can be like, I want to save this as like 2007 natural. Hmm. Like you can, it's, it's like endless. Wow. So Rhino, like almost, I know people who use it like basically to import export files just because you can convert it's it. It's robust. Any interesting. Interesting. So here's, I don't here's, know. here's something I've done before when I started with a new water jetter that you might consider is have them screenshot and send you a picture of the nest yeah after it's programmed yeah and then zoom in on it and make sure yeah. everything looks good and make sure the scaling and like also the reason i initially asked for that is i want to make sure they were actually doing it as efficiently as possible yeah um and weren't like yeah we gave it you know quarter inch margins yeah. and like so right. uh that might be a good I All did ask him for that. I was like, yeah, okay, yeah. I was like, okay. I was like, so moving forward, I was like, I just want to confirm once you go before you cut, mm -hmm. I want to have eyes on. Yeah. And he yeah. was like, yeah, no problem. I just send you a screenshot. Yeah. It was funny. I had mentioned something. Um, I had like had like some annotation on my schematic about like, like uh, I think you had mentioned it like, Oh, like make sure to cut like this you know, cut the pockets and then cut the profile on one for moving on or whatever it was. And he was like, I mentioned something else. And he was like, don't worry, we'll cut on the right side of the line. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> nice. Like, <laughs> yeah, little, little details, man. <laughs> it's like, yeah, little, little details. details. Yeah, it, dude, water jet. Oh man, it's, it, it's good. It's good when it's good, but yeah. it can be a massive debacle if, and that's why local is really good because especially if you were like okay i'm having them cut four sheets of material it's probably wise to have them cut one and you pick up the parts like hey the, right. the water jet's gonna be done about 3 30 if you want to swing by and yep. make sure that they you're not disturbing their flow but like yep. go take a little peek at what they're doing um because man this this cpm steel's so expensive dude and yeah it's a rough day if you end up like miscutting. cutting it's rough so exciting yeah. it's just it's just a different it's a different feeling well no i'm trying to think of how to like verbalize this it actually doesn't feel different the process is different but i'm i'm getting the same enjoyment and satisfaction out of it in different ways than mm -hmm. like if i just went to a bandsaw because mm -hmm. it's like all still there um right now a lot of that i think is around the CAD side, but also because I'm 3D printing everything, I'm getting like these really tangible results, mm -hmm. um, like much more so even than like the way that I was doing knives before where like once I machined some, I knew what they felt like mm -hmm. and then I would make changes. It's like this is this is a much like quicker uh, yeah. kind of flow of like iteration, especially with the fixed blade. It's almost like you're starting with a finished product. Yeah. And then working backwards to turn yeah. it into a real product kind of in a yeah. way. It's like paint by numbers. It's like yeah. after after you've after you've finished it, now you start it. It's it's yeah. weird. Yeah. It's weird. Well, and I, I'm seeing that too, which is like 
for so long, I've been like very folder focused and I wanted to do fixed blades again for a, a long, a lot of years. Right. Mm-hmm. And we, we had done it a little bit when we were on Cape, we started like doing batches. Um, but they were still like, we weren't sending out for water jet. Like we were just doing kind of everything in house. And what I'm seeing with this is that it, the process of building a fixed blade, like this first one, everything is taking me forever, but I'm literally learning it mm-hmm. over Mm-hmm. The next one I'm seeing like, okay, now I like have this method of building a fixed blade. Mm-hmm. And that's super exciting because I have so many designs that I want to yeah. mess with. And it's really exciting. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and especially once you get that all cammed up in fusion, because what I'll do is like, let's say I make the fixture and I have that tree of the elements of cam. Yeah. Try to, when you're machining it, if you're making changes, try to keep in mind that that's going to be copy and pasted later. So it's easy to like kind of hack it a little bit where you're like, I'll just just this, uh, this, uh, instead of making the sketch different, I'm going to pump that out with stock to leave or like some hack, like try to avoid that. Because what I like to do is copy the entire tree from the last fixture I made, paste it in the new fixture. And then all you have to do is select all the new geometry and because right. it's the same concept of a fixture, right? Usually there's almost no difference in terms of the cam. And in doing so, if I like, oh, the last one, I, I could have been more aggressive on that three eighths, like rougher of aluminum, mm-hmm. like it could have gone faster. I'm like, I'm going to go up like 20%. Right. Run it. And then in my head, I'm going to be like, yeah, it probably still could have gone rougher. So it's like every time I copy the most recent one, and so it's like that tree of the cam for all of those components or all of those operations is like slowly evolving over time. Are, and and so, you're talking specifically like as it relates to the machining the fixture. The fixture. Right. The fixture. I yeah. mean, the knife The knife carries over too. Same. Beat, I do the same with right? the knife. Like when yeah. I'm making a titanium frame lock, like my feeds and speeds carry over, whether it's yeah. a you know, bigger knife, smaller knife, like yep. you're basically like populating based on this this little like envelope of process. Yep. Exactly. I think that that has been one of the most satisfying things about fusion so far is kind of figuring out like logical design and constraints where you're like, yeah, I will probably change this later. I'm going to make this robust so that I can change it. Yeah. Carry that into fixture. Yeah. It makes perfect sense. It's like, okay, now your knife is a different profile, but all everything in there, all of the machining is the same. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's cool. I can't and wait. That did bite me though, because in the LT5 project, everything has changed. The fixtures are totally different. Okay. Everything is different. So what I did is I when I did when I broke that tap, what happened was I have these quarter 20 holes in all my fixtures for hold down, and I only have to do them like a half inch deep. Mm-hmm. And that's fine. I copy and pasted that cam into the new fixture for the LT5 scales. And I needed quarter 20 holes for pit bull clamps. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, those pit bull screws are like three quarter of an inch long sticking Mm -hmm. out the bottom. So I was like, well, I got to make that deeper. And so I did some measurements. I'm like, yeah, I've got enough stick out. I've got enough flute length. Like, yeah, I can do it. So I took the same RPM, the same tapping cycle, and I increased the depth. And I was like, it's fine. It's always worked. Well, it was too deep. It chip packed, bound up, and broke oh. the tap. So it was about 180 thou extra depth was the threshold. And that I had done that tapping cycle at that half inch depth like 80, 90 times, right. zero issue. The extra 200 thou, I was overly confident that it was like going to just straight up repeat. It'd just be fine. So in changing a fixture, like you have to, I have to now be better prepared to revisit those kinds of things you know what i mean and like that was a machining fundamentals like i should have known going deeper on that tap was eventually going to require me to peck tap it right which is multiple in out in out to try to clear and i just spaced it because i was like it's always worked it's just a little bit deeper it'll be fine it wasn't fine yeah (laughs) yeah and it buried it it like buried that tap so it that's where that's where you see it's experience of years it's those moments where you're just like you don't like sure there's things that you can learn if you go to school there's like things that you can pick up if you're reading and like studying it's some of it like you're just experiencing it Mm -hmm. um 
I don't know. Um, did you see Bob T is doing like a subscription, like knife making? Not not necessarily like school, but basically like consulting, like a digital apprenticeship, like a digital apprenticeship. And that wow. is it's really, really cool from Bob. That's essentially what you get because of how he works. You get this thought process of problem solving that is pretty yeah. unique. Yeah, very. That's amazing. That is, I know. I didn't you know get that. like That's one really on cool. one time. Um, yeah, if you guys are listening to this, it's definitely worth checking out. Um, and, and, like, and that's brilliant from a like you hear about all the makers that have passed, yeah. like you know, you're loveless, and it's like there's yep. the two or three 19 year old kids, yeah, that, that grew up to be modern makers, and they're like, yeah, yeah I, I got to be in the loveless shop, yeah, it was amazing, totally. but in, in the past, that was only like one or two, three people, yeah. especially in the later years of someone like Loveless's yeah. life. It's like, it's just, it's an untapped potential. Yeah. Whereas it's brilliant for Bob because it's like, what if 20, 30, 40 people could say that and right. expand on what I worked on for my whole yeah. life? Well, That's he's, amazing. and he's so, he's so good as a community member mm -hmm. and like a founder, like in so yeah, many ways. Absolutely. And, and like, I got to fit, I am one of the makers who got to physically work in his shop, you know, as mm -hmm. a shop hand. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. I knew at the time that that was special. How I feel about it now is like very different because when you look at like the historical context of some of this stuff, it's like one of my mentors worked in the Bob Loveless shop. Like, Bob's worked with Bob Loveless and you're like, I think that those links are really, mm -hmm. really cool. Um, so I don't know. I think, you know, and Bob, Bob's getting up there and he's a really hard worker. And I think he, there's some legacy stuff that he really wants to pass yeah. down. And this yeah. is a cool way to do it. That's brilliant. Honestly, I, I, lo I love that idea. That's I so know. Cool. <laughs> yeah. So we'll have to, uh, we'll have to talk more about it. I'd actually, he's another one that I would love to have on mm -hmm. and maybe like, maybe we wait until that's running a little bit and just kind of like, you know, See ask him about it. Yeah. 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 Um, we're, we're approaching doing an interview. I yeah, mean, that's are. like coming up like pretty soon. We have to just yeah. stick a date on it. Yeah. We need to. When do you want to do it? When should we um, shoot for Let's you want to get after. in your shop? Yeah. Can we shoot for after <laughs> I move into my shop? Um, and uh, first recording of March. First recording of March. Is that doable? Yeah. How big of a buffer is that leaving you? Uh, two weeks. Okay. Yeah. So let's I'm, shoot. I'm so let's, let's reach out. I'm trying to put the final pieces in the shop on the 23rd is the goal. Okay. On the 23rd. Dude, that's so exciting. I'm Big. stoked. Okay. I will say, I think having actual lights in there is what's going to make me really, really stoked. Yeah. It's a cave right now. It is yeah. so dark yeah. that it doesn't feel like a machine shop to me. It doesn't feel like my shop to me. Yeah. It's too dark. Yeah. So that, I think that's going to really... nice. You've already... You like went in and built some infrastructure into the shop. And this... Like, if you're not... If you're not a shop person, I don't think it like translates how, I mean, it's a home mm -hmm. as much as you like to like nest and decorate and like organize and personalize your home. Uh, like the shop is, I think, well, one-to-one. -one. Yeah. Yeah. Right? If not more so. If sometimes. not more so, like yeah. arguably we, me and Maddie joke sometimes. Cause I'm like, there will be a day where we can buy a house that isn't based on the shop. Yeah. I have not hit that day yet. Mm -hmm. Like, but I mean, it's because it, it's like you buy a shop that has a house. Yeah. That's like the way yeah. it works. Yeah. You the know? value pack. Yeah. The, it's like the value pack. Yeah. But yeah. since I mean, so since you're in there, like building rooms and starting to like personalize it, like when you go in, you're going to feel 
it's already your space yeah which is pretty yeah. cool yeah the connection starting to form have yeah, uh, I, I can feel it have the kids been going over oh yeah Did yeah because the last three weekends we basically just went all the way through the weekend just working on the shop and so they it's empty mostly so they brought like their bikes over and their scooters yeah. and their remote control car and they're driving it around and uh yeah it's uh it's been fun i have i have some very good memories of Bo in the cape shop and just doing the same thing man like riding a scooter around in there coming in and like he's like love frozen so like come in and like sing songs from frozen and just like yeah. big space like big and like i don't know just like a really that's like a special age yeah it is it, it's been great Be- becca walked over there with a stroller today and love she wanted it. to time oh. it and she said it was eight minute walk pushing a stroller so she's hopefully going to be over there come have lunch with us every once in a while oh kids. yeah man so. i mean like they'll be able to ride bikes over and see you and yeah. like that right now that has actually been when we think when we think about like next, I don't know, like next five years, that's the one where I can't really wrap my head around is like, if I go to an external shop offsite shop, like not being close enough to like walk in and out and like see my family. And like, you actually are close enough that like you can go home for lunch, Mm -hmm. you know, if you want to, or like the kids can come over and see you for like 20 minutes during the day. And like, Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I, I just think there's so much value in that. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I don't think I could ever do, I mean, I obviously situation could change, but like there's, I have a pretty short limit on how far away I would allow my shop to be yeah. from the house. Um, I grew up with a dad that was worked from home saddle yeah. maker shop was at home. Yeah. I loved that. Yeah. Having a separate building, I think, is amazing and good. Having a separate building um, is is definitely paramount. Yeah. But like, either on the property or like eight minute walk is not really that much Mm-mm. further than being on the property. So like that range, I, I'd love to re- retain that as long as possible. Well, and that's like, I mean, that's perfect for where you're at now. And the extension is like, and this is where we've kind of been thinking is like, there's two routes. It's like down the road. I decide that we want to live on the outskirts of town or something, right? Either I buy a house and figure out a shop on the property that is basically what we have now, or it's tricky, right? Like if you want to scale, you either buy a commercial space or you build a commercial space on your property Mm -hmm. where you're at. Like you could get some land, like maybe the move is actually like, you're like, oh yeah, house is over there on like this part of five acres Mm -hmm. shop is over here near the main road, but it's a real, you know, two bay commercial. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, And that's like the, that to me is like the best of both worlds. Mm -hmm. Um, I just don't know like how feasible it is. Yeah. It's an expensive way to do it, but it's it's, expensive. But is it, is it more expensive than buying a house and a shop? probably similar to be honest one of the kickers for me is i'm beginning to slide down a ramp into needing three phase full stop yeah Yeah. um right now i could easily move out of this shop and go back to a phase converter right they do make phase converters that are like really really big sure um it's always possible for sure but there is a, a tipping point where it's like three phases your machinery this in this shop you are starting to not be able to go back into a home yeah. shop. It's like an irreversible thing. It's after irreversible. A well, I mean, unless number. you just yeah. fully get rid of equipment and like, yeah, yeah, unless it's a downsizing. Yeah. yeah. So you're you're really, yeah, you're kind of like tied to it, and that's where that's where I'm at now. Is like my shop can't fit that much more, mm-hmm. but it also doesn't have to. Mm-hmm. I could have one or two employees in here if I really wanted to, but it's still like, it still starts to push it. Mm -hmm. And that, I guess, so that'll be like in the next like three to five years, I suppose would be like that decision. And like, I look at, I look at commercial space. Like I don't think I would buy a single space 
for my business, but I would definitely buy like a three bay. Mm -hmm. Cause then yeah. you have, you've got like residual, you've got like, you know, a couple renters and you've got your business. It's mm -hmm. like just good investment in general. Yeah. 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 That's a good idea. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. We have a three year lease signed. I don't know Perfect. what the future holds after that, but do you have option to extend? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So three year with option to extend yeah. that gives you so much leeway. Yeah. yeah. Because you you're going to know where your business is at pretty, I yeah. mean, in two years, you're going to have a different sense. Yeah. The, the business is maturing. It yeah. feels like very quickly. It's always going to be, you know, still moving. It's never going to be totally stable and whatnot, but right. like, it, like the business is still very young from a manufacturing standpoint. And so it's, it seems like it's like, I could, it just seems like in the next three years, it's going to mature to the point where big decisions could be made. And I don't even yeah. mean growth wise right. or size wise. I just mean like by then machines will be getting paid off that have already been bought, you know, like the initial days of like, I don't even have a stand for my bench grinder. Like, you know what I mean? Right. Like those days are gone. The, yeah. Those days yeah. will be covered. And it's like the electrical is all sorted. The, yeah. uh, you know, everything's kind of organized. Um, that's starting to materialize a little bit, it feels like. Um, so three years from now, it's going to be interesting. Very well, curious. and that's probably a really good, that's probably a really good place to take a pause. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like once you're like, oh man, okay, we just went through this crazy cycle where everything was building. Mm -hmm. Now it just works. I think it's really easy to want to like push past that when in certain ways it's like, that's like the most enjoyable elements. Yeah. yeah. Like everything's working, Like you yeah. don't get better than that in a certain way. Yeah. yeah but yeah. it's so easy to be like, I can make it better. <laughs> I yeah. can do more. I can, yeah. Yeah. I can change it. Yeah. It's, it's going to be interesting for sure, but still a lot of change coming. It's good, so, man. Um, good. One month, basically less than a month. Uh, Jeez, two, weeks. two weeks yeah two weeks oh okay all right so we'll see if i can stick to that it it all comes down to is the rigger going to be available um after the electrician is finally done and then i call is the rigger going to be ready to roll right we'll see okay we'll see it's good it's good man i feel like that uh i feel like that's all i needed to say today yeah that was a fun one <laughs> Appreciate everyone in Patreon. We've been yep, chatting it up a little bit in there. A couple of teasers in there from both Luke and I that are not exposed elsewhere as far yep. as I know. Yep. Um, but yeah, appreciate you guys. Love seeing interaction. Love chatting with you guys. Keep questions coming. Um, give us feedback. Ask mm -hmm. for feedback. Post some work that you guys are working on, whatever. Heck yeah. All right. Peace.